Everybody, welcome to the National Government Webinar Series, Survey 123 Beyond the Basics. As Margie said, my name is Cade Bean, and I'm a solution engineer for the National Government, Science, and Civilian Team. I'm based out of the Denver Regional Office, but like many of you, I'm working home uh, from the comfort of my home. I predominantly support the EPA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the USDA, and I specialize in mobile data collection solutions. I'm really happy and excited to be here today to share with you some more advanced techniques surrounding Survey 123. So here's what we're gonna chat about today. First, we'll level set to ensure that we're all on the same page. Then we'll jump right in to talk about Survey 123 Connect and some specifics like line and polygon collection, handling location, editing workflows, some design consideration, webhooks, and we'll wrap up with some resources for further research. I'm not sure about you, but I learned best by seeing examples. So today's webinar is going to be pretty demonstration heavy. During this webinar, I'm making a few assumptions I wanna make sure that you're aware of straight away. Firstly, I'm assuming you have a basic knowledge of how to build surveys using XLS form syntax, as well as how to navigate Microsoft Excel. I'm assuming you've authored a few surveys using Survey123 Connect. And I'm also assuming that you understand how to build some simple calculations, like if statements or count functions. Most importantly, I'm assuming that you're here to nerd out with me about Survey123. As you all know, Survey123 is a form-centric data collection application within the ArcGIS platform. It contains conditional logic to build smart forms, and it helps bring near real-time data to your decision making. So now that we have that out of the way, let's get the intro stuff, and let's take some time today to get right to the nitty gritty. So there are two methods to author surveys in Survey123. Uh, Survey we have the Survey123 web designer, which is a graphical user interface with drag and drop functionality. We also have Survey123 Connect that leverages XLS form for fine grain tuning and custom functions. Unsurprisingly, we're gonna be spending most of our time today talking about crafting surveys with Survey123 Connect. Let's start by looking at handling points, lines, and polygons. In GIS, it's a well-known rule that multiple geometry types cannot share the same space. That means you can't have points and lines living within the same attribute table. But imagine you have a team that's conducting an environmental impact assessment. They'll need to collect point locations of sensitive species. They'll need to delineate perennial streams with line features and capture water body locations for wetland assessment. What if you could record all three geometry types within one survey? Knowing that we need to have three separate tables to incorporate all three geometry types, we can leverage repeat groups to store different types of geometry. So let's take a look. We'll start here in Survey123 Connect. If we expand our points, lines, and polygons group, we'll see that we have a few repeat groups, one for points, lines, and polygons, respectively. We can capture a point. We can also capture a line here. Use the sketch tool. And as we move down to collect a polygon, you'll notice that we have an input type here. We can select either vertex or we can select sketch. By default, collecting a polygon or collecting a line, you'll have the sketch method as an input type. But if we'd like to collect as a vertex, we can set that mode as well. So here we can go ahead and capture a polygon right with the vertices. Furthermore, we can create a calculation of our polygon using an area calculation as we've done here to persist area attributes in the feature service. Let's open up the XLS form and see what's happening here behind the scenes. As you can see, we have three separate repeat groups here. Again, one for points, one for lines, and one for polygons. What happens when this gets published over to ArcGIS Online or your portal is that a related table is created for each repeat group. So in this case, we'll have a point table, a line table, and a polygon table that will relate to the parent table. So let's examine our sketch type option that we've set up here. So again, by default, the method is going to be set to sketch but we can pass that value dynamically. Here, we've created a choice list called sketch type and created two values, vertex and sketch. Using the Esri style body column here of our XLS form, we can pass the value of our sketch type selection over to a parameter called method. And this will allow the surveyor to go ahead and select the sketch type that they would like. So now that we have our survey published, let's check it out in ArcGIS Online. When you publish the survey, a hosted feature layer is created. And in this case, we have four different layers that are created. 
We have the parent table. In this case, it's called Beyond the Basics. And we also have three additional tables, a point table, a line table, and a polygon table that correspond to each to our repeat group that we've created. If we examine the data tab, we can see that within each point table, line table, or polygon table is a parent global ID. And this is going to relate the particular record back to the parent table. For now, let's move back into our presentation and let's check out handling location. Before that, we're gonna talk a little bit about poll data. Poll data is an important function to understand. It allows you to extract values from an external CSV or from device and user properties, geopoints, and media. So let's break this down. If we're referencing a CSV in this case, you need to enter the CSV in the Survey123 media folder without the extension. If you are calling device and user properties, you'll use at property. For GPS data, you'll use at geopoint. Or if you're accessing media, you'll use at access or at JSON. Next, the return column defines the name of the column in the CSV containing the value you'd like to return. The key value defines the name of the lookup field. And the lookup value is the value that will be used to search the key value field. For example, here's a choice list from Survey123 and a snippet from our CSV called plantlist.csv. Notice how we didn't add the name of the extension here. So our goal in this situation is to allow the surveyor to search for a common name of the species and then have the scientific name of that species returned based on the selection. So if a surveyor searches for boreal owl, the value returned by Survey123 is B-O-O-W. This is the lookup value from our formula. The lookup value is used in the species code column to return the scientific name. This is particularly useful when you need to have a long list of choices like plant or species. To achieve this without an external CSV, the large species list would have to be copied multiple times in your XLS form with differing names in the choice list, thus significantly slowing down the performance and the speed at which the survey loads. It's important to note here that the poll data function is available for connected and disconnected use. So let's move back into our survey and then we'll take a look at another use of poll data to access that location information that I mentioned earlier from a geo point. So here in our geo point group, let's reveal a couple fields that I have hidden. Here we have two calculate fields, the first of which calculates the source of the geo point, whether or not the GPS was used to capture a point or the map was used. If we examine the calculate field, we can see that we're leveraging poll data to achieve this. Here, the formula is a bit different than we've seen it for CSV because we're not using a lookup value. In this case, we're calling a very particular piece of metadata from that geo point property. So our first parameter is at geo point and that references the geopoint data we'd like to extract. The second field is going to reference our actual geopoint name, in this case, collect the point. Then we're gonna pass a parameter that pulls out the data of choice. In this case, we're pulling out the position source type. We've created a second calculation here, again, doing the same thing at geopoint, referencing the geopoint field name. And in this case, we're pulling out horizontal accuracy. Now, in this case, horizontal accuracy is going to be stored as an attribute that we can use for additional analysis. And we'll see an example of that shortly. Furthermore, what we've done is added a accuracy threshold. And what this does is it determines the uh, horizontal accuracy that needs to be attained in order to record this particular record. In this case, I've set it to six and it defaults to meters. So if the horizontal accuracy is greater than six meters, this will not be able to be recorded. Next, let's look at our bind warning and our warning message. In this case, we're setting a warning to appear if the location source calculation does not equal one. When it does not equal one, that means that the location has been captured manually on the device. When that happens, a warning message appears to instruct the surveyor to collect it based on the GPS device. So if we go back into our form, we can see here that if we collect one manually, submit our record, we can see that we have a warning here 
The location has been captured manually. Please capture with the GPS. And now you'll note here that my horizontal accuracy isn't being stored, and that's because I've disabled my location for privacy settings. But let's see what that looks like back in our slides. So at the top, we can see the result of setting the bind accuracy threshold to six. So to recap, we looked at leveraging poll data on a geo point to persist horizontal accuracy, as well as determine the source of GPS collection for use in a warning banner. So with the horizontal accuracy now accessible in our feature service, we can visualize accuracy in a web map or a web application by buffering based on that accuracy value, as you see here on the left. In the survey, we saw a warning banner. So similar to the image on the right, we see a yellow banner across the top, but you can also set a hard constraint based on those values extracted from the pull data function to get a hard constraint as we see on the right side. So now that we have a handle on poll data and location considerations, let's change the gears a little bit and look into some editing workflows. There are a number of ways to edit existing data. We can leverage a web form. On the left is an edit directly within a web browser. On the top right, we can see editing within a web application like Operations Dashboard. And on the bottom right, you can use webhooks to email a link for editing within a browser. We can also use the inbox in Survey123 field application. This workflow shows how you can load existing building footprints and update attributes without altering the geometry. I know this GIF is moving a little quickly, but we'll dive into this here shortly. Furthermore, you can pull the hosted feature layer directly into ArcGIS Pro from your organization's portal. And you can edit that feature service directly within the desktop. As a note, ArcGIS Pro now supports undoing or discarding edits, where previously any edits that were made were immediate and permanent. So let's see some of this in action. In this demonstration, we're going to leverage an existing feature service to update attribute data. In this scenario, I would like to be able to review the status of a completed work task at a specific parcel and update it to an active. To accomplish this, I have taken El Paso County parcel data and added a status field with the domain values active and inactive before publishing. In Survey123 Connect, I have the option to create a new survey based on an existing feature service. If I select this option and I select this 90 minute drive time from CREL and create a survey, I will have a new Survey123 form that is based on the schema of this existing feature survey. To save a little bit of time, I've done this already. To use this feature, the most important setting we'll need to do is to enable the inbox within Survey123 Connect. If we go to Settings and Inbox, we can enable that directly from here. By default, the inbox is disabled, so you will need to enable it in order to access this feature. As soon as it's enabled, we have two additional parameters that we can configure. The first of which is the query expression, which is a SQL-like expression where we can filter all of the records within the feature service. For example, we can filter based on a username, or we can even filter based on a date. Next, by default, a spatial filter is enabled on the map view. This means that whichever map extent that you have within your map on your field application will filter based on that map extent. So let's see what this looks like in the Survey123 field app. So here's our parcels in El Paso County. We have a couple options. I can either collect a new geometry, I can edit an existing record, or I can edit records that I've previously edited. In this case, let's check out the inbox. The first window we're presented with is the list view, and this is gonna show a list of all of the items and all of the records that are contained within this particular feature service. I can search by parcel or any other attributes that are contained therein. If I go to the map view, I can zoom in dynamically and view any of the building footprints. You'll see them pop up as you zoom in, and the map view is going to be filtered spatially based on that selection. So if I click an existing record, you'll see that the polygon is automatically populated, pulls in any of the area data and the perimeter, and here I can set my work status to an active to complete my workflow. Any of the existing data can be further edited here if we need to change the legal description of the site, then we can go ahead and submit our record. If we select send now, and I'm in a connected environment, we can send this across to the feature service immediately. I can select continue this survey to make any additional edits, 
or I can save this survey to the outbox. For a disconnected workflow, saving to the outbox will allow me to make any additional edits before I send this over to the future service. Similarly to the inbox, I have a list view and I have a map view of any of the items that I've previously edited. I can click them and I can make any additional edits before then sending across to the future service. So let's take a look at another editing workflow within a dashboard. Finally, you can integrate the results of your survey into a dashboard for situational awareness. You can also embed edit workflows directly into the dashboard to push edits out in real time. Here we're looking at a work request called A1A. And if we click update request in this case, it's going to bring up our survey and auto-populate the workstation ID. And from here, we can make any edits to the request status. Now we're gonna move into some design consideration. And so this may be a basic XLS form feature, but I do want to touch on it as they are absolutely essential in creating a well-designed survey. The groups allow you to combine like questions within your form. You can take them a step further by customizing them with HTML code to modify the font size, background color, and more to make your groups stand out, as you can see here. Furthermore, you can hide specific groups to be completed only when relevant questions are answered for a more streamlined survey. As you probably noticed as a best practice, I like to bold the begin and end group statements to help me visualize the survey in a more organized fashion. Similarly, I like to italicize the begin and end group statements. Grids and pages expand on the idea of a group to ensure that you have a seamless surveyor experience. The grid theme is a great way to replicate paper forms. As you see on the right, this is a certificate of roadworthiness that has been transformed into a similar form directly within Survey123. Pages allow you to add additional pages to the form to relieve the ever-scrolling nature of longer forms. And of course, you can combine them both into one form. I'll show you one of our pre-built templates that you can access through Survey123 Connect. If you were unaware, we have a handful, handful of pre-built surveys that you can use as templates for crafting your form. If you click samples, we can use any of these pre-built forms. Everything from barcodes to cascading selects can be found here. In this case, we're gonna examine the grid style groups group. I've already created one of these, so let's jump in and take a look. Here, we can see that a grid theme has been set to display multiple fields within a single row. We have registration number, year, and make are all within one row. Let's take a look at the XLS form and see how this works. Firstly, you want to make sure that you set the style within the settings tab to be equal to the grid theme. Here's our style column, and you can see that we've set that parameter equal to theme grid. Furthermore, you can add an additional style if you'd like. Here, we added a space separated style called pages. So now, we'll be using the grid theme and pages within this particular form. Grids are set at the group level. So the first group here, certificate, we can see that we have a total width set to eight. And this is delineated by the letter W followed by a number eight. In this case, each row within this particular group will have a value of eight that you can fill. So for these first three items, we have a width three plus two plus three adds up to equal to eight. So that means that our registration number, year, and make will all be contained within the first row. Furthermore, you can space separate additional appearance values. In this case, we have autocomplete that is set with a width of three. So this makes it very easy if you have an existing form that you would like to translate into a good theme. So let's go back and examine some of the other items within our form here. So, on this page, this illustrates a grid group that is surrounded by photos within a single row. So this is set to a width, this is set to width one, and this is set to width one. So the group is set to a width three. Next, repeat groups also adhere to the grid theme. This page shows how you can set two repeat groups that are separated vertically. We have a repeat group on the left and a repeat group on the right here. Similarly, you can separate them vertically. So now we have a repeat group on the top 
and a repeat group here on the bottom. As a design consideration, it's incredibly important to understand how the survey will be completed and on what platform it will be completed. So something like this might look really nice on a tablet. All of these pages look wonderful, but if you plan on having your surveyors complete this on a smartphone, this looks really jumbled and is very difficult to complete. So it's very important to understand how your survey is going to be consumed to ensure that you're adhering to great design. Let's move back into our presentation to finish out talking about some design considerations. Scalable vector graphics, or SVGs, are two-dimensional XML-based vector graphics that, in this case, allow you to select a particular area of an image to return a string based on the ID of the vector path. We'll get into this shortly. You can leverage SVGs to make your forms nearly error-proof. Furthermore, with selectable graphics, you can do creative things like watermark a photo with the name of the item being selected or create relevant fields based on that selection. So let's see how this works. It's that time of the year where folks start planting their gardens. My girlfriend has actually been really excited about planting lavender in ours, so I thought it might be useful to create a quick survey that might help flower producers quickly identify locations of specific lavender species based on an image in the form. So I found this great photo from myseeds.co that I'd like to use in my survey. This is a JPEG, so it's not quite in the SVG format that I need. But fear not, we can use Inkscape, which is a free and open source SVG editor to create an SVG from this JPEG. So here's Inkscape, and I've loaded up my JPEG. The first thing that we'll need to do is we'll need to create paths for each individual species photo. So we'll bring up our objects pane. To save a little bit of time, I've already delineated a couple of these paths, but I'll show you how to create one. So we're gonna use this pen tool here, and we're just gonna tap a couple vertices here right on the picture. We'll double click to complete. And as soon as that's complete, it should pop up a path here. Let's try that one more time. There we go. So now we have a new path that has appeared within our object pane. From here, I can double click this and we can change this over to match the hid coat blue species that we've just passed over. Once we're ready to go, we've created all of our paths. We want to save this as an SVG within the media folder of our survey 123 design. That way we can access it within our XLS form. So once we've re renamed our path, we've saved our SVG to our media folder, we can go in and examine the XML that makes up this particular SVG. So I've opened this up in Notepad++, and as you can see, this is the XML of the SVG, and it's pretty messy. So let's just go all the way to the bottom where we can view all of the paths that we've created here. So we have this path tag here, and each of them is going to pass across the label that we've added in Inkscape. And by default, actually, it's going to leave the name of the path that was created when you initiated the path. So all you'll need to do is just copy this Inkscape label right over into the ID field. So I've done that for all eight of these paths. But for demonstration purposes, I'm going to leave this as a path set to 70. So now that my SVG is edited, it's ready to go, let's go ahead and check out our XLS form. Go ahead and unhide these rows here. So the first thing that we've done is we've created a select one. And we've passed the choice called lavender. We'll give this just a second to continue loading. There we go. So for each path, I've created a species that I want to match up to it. We have the name and a label for each of them. The next thing that we need to do is we need to set the appearance to image map. That way we can select the graphic. Then we need to point to the particular SVG that is contained within our media file, in this case, lavender.svg. And again, just make sure, unlike the poll data, we've, let, we've actually used the extension here, .svg. So the next thing we've done is I've just created a note here. And this is just going to dynamically display the name of the species based on the selection. Then just for fun, we've created a watermark here, so just in case, Whoever is looking over these photos, after they've taken them in the field, they want to see the name of the species 
along with the photo that has been captured. So here we're using a concat calculation that concatenates the word species along with a dynamic selection from our select one here. It is very important to note that you cannot add this watermark directly into the parameters here for the image. So this needs to actually reference the calculation, this particular field, as opposed to entering the calculation directly in parameters. So let's jump into our survey here in survey one, two, three, connect, and we can see some of this in action. We expand our selectable graphics. We can see here now that we have an SVG, and as we move over, we can select each individual path. And the name of the species is going to appear in our notes section here. So we can select elegant sky, Italian lavender. And remember, we set Sancho Panza equal to path 70. So this uses the ID and not necessarily that label from Inkscape. So the ID has to be set to the value that you'd like it to appear. So let's see how this watermark works here. We're going to go ahead and take a picture of some hit code blue. And here in my goofy picture, you can see that we have our species and then we have hit code blue from based on our selection as a watermark directly on top of our photo. Now that we have our survey set up with selectable graphics, our lavender producers can quickly identify and capture the location of these nine specific lavender species based on a photo selection. Let's move back into our presentation. And let's start talking about URL scheme. With our design considerations out of the way and our survey published, we'll talk about how we can incorporate our survey into some existing solutions. The URL scheme allows you to integrate with other applications across the ArcGIS platform, as well as third-party applications. You can do more than just open up another app from Survey123. You can actually pass values across to the other application. So here's an example. It's a bit of a mess. So much like we did with our pull data function, let's break this down. This portion here defines which app we will be opening. In this case, Survey123. This portion is the item ID of the form. It's important that you do not use the item ID from the hosted feature layer. We want to reference the form. You can get this pretty quickly by going to the item details on your enterprise portal or ArcGIS online and grabbing the item ID from the top of these things. Next, we'll use an ampersand to pass another parameter called field, followed by the name of the field from Survey123 and the value you'd like to pass. In this case, we are passing the value start to the Survey123 field called surname. And finally, we are using the center parameter to center the map on this particular set of coordinates. You can also pass dynamic values, and we'll see an example of this shortly. This particular URL scheme is designed for application-to-application -application integration. But what if we wanted to pass values to a web survey? You can harness a set of URL parameters in Survey123 to pass values to a survey specifically for use within a web browser. This can be helpful for desktop workflows that don't necessarily require your team to be out in the field. But let's go ahead and step through this one as well. First, you'll see that we are using the HTTPS protocol and pointing to the item ID of the form that's in the share section of the Survey123 website. This would be as if we went to the Survey123 website's Collaborate tab for our survey and snagged the Share This Survey link. Here's what that would look like. So if we posted this link into our browser, we would see something very similar to this. <clears throat> Next, we have a question mark indicating that we are beginning to pass parameters to the URL. Next, we have our first parameter field. Here, we are passing a dynamic value from a web map called submitter to the field that we've created in our survey called submitted by. This means when we open up this survey from a particular geometry on our web map, the value from the submitter field is automatically populated in the submitted by field when we open up the web form. Then we pass another dynamic attribute to the surname field and we can see a new parameter that we haven't seen yet called mode. This allows the user to choose whether they'd like to open the form in the field or a browser with using the menu. There are a number of other options you can use here that are detailed in our documentation. Lastly, we see another new parameter called hide. This allows you to hide specific fields or elements from the survey. 
Here, we're hiding the survey date field and the custom theme that has been applied to the survey. So let's check this out. I worked with a customer recently to create a solution to identify specific needs within the community to effectively allocate government funds efficiently. The workflow involves the surveyor accessing a web application, displaying the location of homes within their community, then conducting a survey within Survey123 to obtain that resident's need, and marking the survey as complete. As there are many households within the community, as you can see here, to make the survey as efficient as possible, we wanted to allow for the ability to pass across values already contained within the home location data. So here's a web application that was built using Web App Builder for ArcGIS. Each individual point is a location of a home within the community that has a number of attributes associated with it, including address, X and Y data, and the name of the household. So if we click on a point, we're presented with an option to conduct a survey. If you remember from our slides, we've actually set this open mode to menu. This means we can either open it within a browser or we can open it in the Survey123 field app. Let's go ahead and select browser. You can see a number of fields are automatically populated. The first and last name, as well as the address that is comprised of street, city, state, and zip. The GPS location was also filled in. I do want to point out a couple of different features within this particular form that we'll analyze when we start looking at the XLS form. Here under the needs and information portion, the surveyor is prompted to select the top three needs. Once they select the needs, a number of fields occur that are based on a relevance that ask the user to rank the importance of each one of these needs. Once they're done, they can go ahead and submit the survey after collecting any additional information. <clears throat> so now let's go ahead and move backwards a little bit, starting from our web map to see how we actually got here. Here's the web map that the application is referencing. Our first step is going to be to configure a custom pop-up that will house our custom URL. If we set the pop-up content display to a custom attribute display and click configure, we can see a custom attribute display. From here, if we click font, or I'm sorry, if we click the HTML source, we can see the custom URL parameter that was created for this particular form. So as we've seen already, this is referencing the Survey123 website, share, and the additional form ID. Once we hit the question mark, we begin entering parameters. In this case, we're setting open equal to menu. We're setting the field that is called RAMEM within Survey123 equal to a couple of dynamic fields that are within the existing point location, being address, city, state, and zip. And you'll note here that I can pass a number of fields over to our Survey123 field. I've separated them by a space, and then within city, state, I've separated them by a column. For our next field, homeowner, we're passing the first name and last name values. And finally, we're doing a center and setting that equal to the Y and the X values that are contained within this particular attribute data. Finally, everything is wrapped by this button that has been generated via the button factory for just a little bit of extra flair. Once we're done, we'll click OK and OK to save our changes. So lastly, let's examine some of those relevance calculations and constraints that make up that survey that we saw as we were completing it. So prepare your machetes, we're jumping pretty deep into the weeds on this one. So our goal here is to allow the user to select exactly three choices from a select multiple, then rank them on a scale of one to three, where one is the most important and three is the least important. There's a lot of room for user error here, so let's go through this workflow step by step to make sure this workflow is near infallible for our surveyors. The first constraint and requirement requires there to be exactly three selections made up for the top two needs. So if we look at our select multiple fields here, the first thing we want to do is make sure that we set our constraint here equal to three. In this case, we're using a count selected function and passing the parameter of the field of the select multiple, which is called need in this case. And we're setting that equal to three. So this function works for select multiples and it counts the number of selections that have been made. We want to ensure that this is a hard constraint where the people who are doing the survey can only select three. 
Next, we need a list of all of the needs. And we're doing this by creating three separate calculations. Our first is called need one, our second is called need two, and our third is called need three. And we take care of this by doing a calculation here. In our calculation column, we can see we have a JR choice name function that's wrapped around a selected at function. The goal here is to pass the label of the selection to a dynamic field that will be filled out by the surveyor. In order to do this, we'll need to use the JR choice name function. If we examine our choices, we can see that we have a name and a label for our need selection here. By default, survey123 is going to pass the value of the name column. And as you probably know, you cannot pass any spaces here. So this doesn't really look pleasant when you are filling out a form. So what we'd like to do instead of passing this value dynamically, we want to pass the label. And again, we do that by using this JR choice name function. And so that's wrapped around another function called selected at. And this determines the position of the selection. This is zero index, meaning that the first selection is zero, the second selection is one, et cetera. So this is going to store the first selection that we select in our select multiple to need one, the second selection to need two, et cetera. Next, we have a note that persists as a warning for the person conducting the survey. I've set some HTML and we've set this font color equal to red. What we would like to do is ensure that they're only entering values between one and three and not entering any duplicates. So we have two relevant, uh, two relevant functions that we have here that this field will appear on. So if the needs rank total does not equal six and the number of selections from our select multiple is equal to three. We'll skip ahead a little bit to this needs rank total since we haven't seen this yet. All this is is a quick calculation to calculate the integers that are filled for the rank. So we want to make sure that they are ranked between a value of one and three and there are no duplicates. So the sum of all values for our integer needs to be equal to six, one plus two plus three. So now that we understand how this works, additionally, we'll have these three new integer fields that will appear so long as there are at least three selections made in our select multiple. The first thing we want to do is set a constraint. We want to make sure that no values less than one and no values greater than three can be selected. So we have set a constraint for each one of these. And so now we have a bit of an understanding of how that works. Let's go back and let's analyze what that looks like again within our form. If we go back to our top three needs in this case, We'll undo these selections so we can step through the process. Our first selection in this case is food for our top three needs. Then we select hay, then mask and gloves. Now that we have three selected, we'll see that we have three additional fields that appear. Our first selection food was stored to the first need. Our second selection hay to the second and mask and gloves was stored to the third. And you'll note here that food is actually returning the name of the value within the label. You can see an example of this at mask and glove. This forward slash would be um, an improper use in the name column. So it's returning the label in this case. And here we need to enter values that are going to total six. So if we enter one, one, and three, we're going to see that our warning message is still here. Once we satisfy the requirements, we can continue completing our survey. Let's go ahead and select a particular surveyor. And then we could submit the record from here. Whew. Okay, so that's quite a bit of information. So let's digest a little bit and we'll go back into our survey or our presentation rather. So the last thing that I wanna to discuss today is webhooks. Webhooks are listeners that create an action based on a trigger. You can create webhooks using Integromat, Power Automate, or other popular webhook clients. In Survey123 with webhooks, you complete tasks like sending an email on specific values submitted in a survey, populating an external database like Postgres, or filling out a row in an Excel spreadsheet. For example, imagine you're reporting graffiti at a campsite. This graffiti is high priority to clean up. As the field crew submits the survey, an email notification is sent to the field coordinator to assign a task to the cleanup crew in real time. 
Webhooks can integrate with hundreds of applications across Windows, Google Cloud, payment services, social media, database, SMS, and loads more. There are a couple of links here that will point you in the right direction, but why don't I just show you instead? For our final demonstration of the day, let's run through a webhook scenario using Integromat. We have a simple workflow that we'd like to accomplish here. When a survey is submitted, we'd like to alert a supervisor that QAQC is ready to take place for a particular record. So let's combine what we've learned about custom URL parameters and now webhooks to satisfy this particular workflow. So here we're looking at Integromat. Integromat is a free and open source webhook client. Although the free account has some limits on the number of requests you can make, it serves well for most use cases. Our first step is going to be to create a new scenario and then add some modules that we'd like to use. We're gonna leverage survey one, two, three in this case. We can select that as a default. And in this case, we'll go ahead and leverage Gmail for our use case. Once we hit continue, we're sent over to our scenario workspace. The first thing that we wanna do when we get to our workspace is we want to click on the individual module and we want to select survey one, two, three. From here, we can select our trig trigger, which in this case is watch the survey. And this is going to listen for when a survey one, two, three response is submitted. The first thing that we'll need to do here is we'll need to configure the webhook. To do that, we'll simply hit add. Then we can start to fill out some parameters of our webhook. We can set a unique name for our webhook, and then we can add a connection either to our ArcGIS online organization or to our enterprise portal in Integromat. Here I've already configured a connection to manage my Esri Federal account. Once we have that connection established, you can view any of the surveys that you have published and you are owning in your particular account. In this case, I've already configured a webhook for a solution, so we'll use that one. Once you have your module complete, we can hit the plus button here to add another module. We'll use Gmail from our default modules when we created our scenario, and we want an action to send an email. So the first thing we'll need to do, like creating a new webhook, is we'll need to create a new connection. In this case, I've connected to my personal Gmail account. We can add a recipient in this case. We'll just go ahead and send it to myself, and we'll hit add. You can add additional recipients as you choose. Next, we can add a subject line here. And you'll notice as I click on some of these parameters, we're prompted with a list of buttons that I can add. These are all dynamic values based on the survey that we have selected for our webhook. In this case, we're looking at the same survey that we had from before with the needs and aid assessment. So from here, we can create a subject, something like a survey submitted for, and here we can actually pass a dynamic value. And I wanna pass the name of the head of the household. So under feature and attributes, we can click on the, the name of the owner or the head of household. And this value will now be extracted from the survey and passed as a dynamic value in our email. Next, we have a content portion here. And this content portion uh, will show us the body of the email. So we'll use this say to uh, be submitted by and we can say the name of the person completing the survey. In this case, that'll be person entering information. Then to complete our workflow, we wanna make sure that we have a link to our individual record that we've submitted. And knowing what we know about custom URLs, we can create that pretty quickly. So now you can view it here, and we've set a link to the survey123.rjs.com share. We're pointing over to the particular form. And we set the mode in this case equal to edit, so the person can go in and conduct any necessary QA, QC. In order to pull up the record that has been submitted from this particular trigger, we need to point it to the proper global ID. And you can access this by using the result and global ID dynamic field. And now we have our module complete. So the first thing we'll need to do is we'll need to test this. If we hit run once, we can come back into our survey here. We'll hit submit. And now that data has been sent across. So it looks like Integromat has already noticed that it's been sent and it's sent an email. So these ones above the modules are gonna indicate the JSON payload as a result of the trigger. We can examine that payload here and we can see the response of it. If we jump into the response, we can see that we did an add result 
and we can see the first item in the array. Here we can see the global ID, and we can see that it was successful in sending that item across. Furthermore, we can view any of the individual attributes that have been sent across as a part of this survey. Here we've sent across Surveyor 2. The head of the household is Eddard Stark, rest in peace. And then the rural address here is the Great Heath in Winterfell, Westra. So if we go into the payload result from our Gmail module, you can see that we've set those dynamic values are pulling across from that payload. So we've submitted by, and we have our Surveyor 2. And then if we look here into the content, we can see that the global ID has been submitted. Well, let's see if that survey has been sent over to my email. I'll give it just another second here to load. And here we are. So now we have an email that has been sent to me. The survey has been submitted for Eddard Stark, and this is the dynamic value. It's been sent to the addressee that we've listed. And then we also have the surveyor two who submitted it, and you can further view it by clicking here. Once you click there, we can see that the mode has been sent to edit in the URL, and the global ID is going to match the global ID from our form. We can see our surveyor two and any of those other attributes that were entered are here and ready for QA QC. And with that, let's jump back into our presentation and let's do a little bit of wrap up. So here's a look at our road ahead. We have some planned releases for earlier this year around the user conference and then after the user conference as well. I'm personally most excited for the images in the inbox. This is a commonly requested feature plan for later this year that will allow you to edit any attachments that have been added as an attachment within the inbox. Just as a note, the roadmap items are always subject to change here. So there's plenty we didn't discuss today. And for additional research, here are some resources that I'll leave you with. The Early Adopter Community is a great way to stay up to date with the latest and greatest. GeoNet is an endlessly helpful community. And if you're not involved, I strongly encourage you to do so. I've also added a link here for a search within our GeoNet to our incredibly useful Tricks of the Trade blog series that has been authored by Ismail Chivite, our product manager for Survey123. And then if we didn't get quite advanced enough for your taste today, definitely check out this final link here that I've posted. This shows you how to leverage the App Studio for ArcGIS to completely customize Survey123 for your use case. So we have seen a lot today. We talked about points, lines, and polygons in the same form. We talked about poll data functions. We talked about location handling. We talked about editing workflows, design considerations, URL themes and parameters. We talked about webhooks. That's a lot to remember. I certainly don't expect you to remember it all. What I will leave you with, however, is that Survey123 is so much more than a basic form builder. If you move beyond the basics, Survey123 can be an end-to-end -end solution for making critical decisions within your organization. Thank you so much for attending today. Please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions in the future. And let's go ahead and open it up for some questions that may have popped up during the webinar. Margie? Great. So the first question we have is uh, dealing with GPS. Uh, so early on, you used a six meter control for location. And this user was wondering, how does Survey123 um, link or not link to a GPS unit? Um, and maybe does it depend on internal GPS unit or chips? Um, and how Survey123 interacts with GPS data? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that I want to touch on is that Survey123 can leverage external GNSS and GPS receivers. For example, if you're leveraging something like an iPhone, you can hook into a bad elf receiver that can supply you with submeter accuracy. And so once you set those settings in the location settings of the field application, you can connect via Bluetooth or via USB or however you need to connect to your device. And then that will be then set as the default value for acquiring GPS data. If you are not leveraging an external GNSS receiver, you will be relying on the internal GPS chip that is within your device. For example, if you're using an iPad that is Wi-Fi only, there is actually no GPS built into that device. You would need to use one of their uh, CDM or GSM devices in order to access that GNSS data within that device. So you're essentially at the mercy of your device's internal GPS chip. So 
as with the grid and design considerations, it's very important to understand what devices that you'll, your field crew will be using out in the field. That way you can best design your form to handle that location data. Great question. Great, we had another user who was interested in finding out which SVG editor you used. Uh, the SVG editor that I use is called Inkscape, I-N-K-S-C-A-P-E, -E, and it is actually free and open source. I didn't pay a dime to create that demonstration that I showed you today. So go download it, check it out. There's some good documentation. Um, if you search our survey123 uh, GeoNet, you'll find some blog posts that actually run through that entire process that I went through today um, in creating those selectable SVG graphics. Um, if you come by the story map that was created by our colleagues over in Esri, Ireland, they created a story map that runs through a very similar use case for selecting some regions within Survey123, and it does a phenomenal job of detailing the individual steps. Great. Another question was, um, can you change the URL scheme to uh, the domain of someone's company? To the domain of somebody's company. So the URL scheme is only going to be compatible with URL schemes that work with our existing scheme. So it, it certainly is possible to do some custom development, but I, I can't really speak to that exact question. Um, I will I will make a note and we'll see if we can uh, get some more information on that. Good question. Great. And the last question um, is about when you were customizing the pop up. Um, they were wondering if you were using Arcade. Uh, I was not using Arcade in that particular use case, uh, though you could. Um, it is very important, though, when you're creating custom URL parameters that you will need to be using HTTP um, or uh, rather HTML um, because that URL parameter does need to access that HTTP protocol typically. So you could use Arcade to pull out some additional values for your pop-up, but that wouldn't really help you create that URL parameter to pass those values across. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, feel free to reach out to me and we can discuss that further. Great. Well, that's all the questions. Thank you so much, Cade, for your time. And thanks, everyone, for attending the webinar. We will be sending out the slides and the video recording once it's available. And everyone, enjoy your day. Thanks, everyone. Take care.